Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of Experimental Cataclysm, the show where I talk about recent changes made to the experimental version of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. We will be covering two sets of spoilers towards the end of the show that are each marked as such in the video timeline and in the description. They are very heavy spoilers, so just be aware of that, and I will make a note of telling you that before we begin talking about it. Also, I am recovering from being sick, so who knows if my voice is going to hold out until the end of the video or not. Let's find out together. Anyway, let's get into the show here. First up, we've got the addition of personal loot zones to the Zone Manager tool from Bombastic Slacks. Now, in this PR, they reference that this change was made because people would be frustrated over bodies not showing loot when they die. It's not really clear to me what that means, I assume it was something I missed over the last few weeks where loot was not displaying with the new corpse pocket. I did notice that items are not showing up in the capital V menu, so that may be what they're referencing here. But the personal loot zones do have value beyond whatever they're talking about. Basically, a personal loot zone is the same as a normal zone that you can set up, except that their location is fixed around the player. So if you make a personal zone for guns directly south of your character, it will always be directly south of your character. No matter where you move, that zone will be exactly where you placed it in relation to the player. These are set up using the Zone Manager tool, which is the capital Y key on your keyboard, but instead of adding a zone normally, you will press the capital P key instead to make a personal zone. So although I didn't understand the reasoning behind why this was added, there is definitely value in it. I'm sure that there's quite a lot of things you could do with this, but the obvious one in my mind is to really speed up the process of looting. You can set up zones all around your player and make the player tile or the tile directly around you or whatever into unsorted zones. Then you could just walk over a fallen enemy, hit the capital O key, and it will sort your loot. This would then automatically remove items from those unsorted tiles as it normally would and pile your things where you like them. And since you as the player control where each of these groups of items would go, you would obviously get used to where the loot will be dropped and you would then probably be able to speed up your looting by a considerable amount of time. I'm not sure that I will personally do this. I think that if you're doing this one enemy at a time, it will simply add more time and key presses than simply looting them the normal way. This is because if you use this uh, zone manager tool, it doesn't pick up the items, it simply moves them off of the body. So you will have the exact same number of key presses to pick them up as you would if you were just looting them manually. It also requires more time since you're moving a lot of items as opposed to only the ones that you're picking up. Now all of that said, for large groups of enemies, the zone manager tool is still very efficient, and having the ability to lock loot zones to your character's position is actually an amazing upgrade. My only negative note about this change is that when you set up a personal loot zone, they will be displayed exactly the same as other loot zones in the tool. This means if you have a gun tile set up in your base and you have a personal gun tile set up, they will display identically in the menu. I actually view this as a pretty significant negative side of this PR. Obviously, if you can't tell loot zones apart, that could be very annoying. I do hope that this gets changed in the future. I think even if you just had a simple letter to represent that it was a personal loot zone, that would be a huge improvement. Other than that, I think this is a really interesting change, and I'm sure many of you will enjoy now having this in the game. Next up, we have some changes to the different levels of cutting quality from Net Sys Fire. From what I can tell, this simply rebalance what each level of cutting actually means. So level 1 now represents primitive or difficult to use cutting items such as a sharp rock or a sword. Obviously neither of those items would be ideal tools for cutting. Most things that were previously cutting level 1 have been increased to cutting level 2. I don't have much to say about this, I just wanted to point out that some of the tools got their quality shuffled around and now some recipes or other things may require a higher tier cutting quality. Moving on, next up from Deceduin, we've got a limitation to iBot spawns. If you've played the game recently and tried your hand at lockpicking doors on certain buildings, you may have noticed that in the hours of failure, you will eventually spawn a gaggle of iBots. Now these iBots in turn would then spawn infinite other robots. This led to people being able to farm robot materials, but also just general unpleasantness for players. I, in fact, had a run end after being shocked to death from a horde of the robots that were spawned by simple iBots. Now this PR limits the robots that the iBot can spawn. They can only spawn three of them, and then after a period of time, that value gets refreshed. In the end, there is a hard cap of 10 robots that can be spawned. 
This is, in my opinion, I think it's something like putting a band-aid on a gaping wound. Although I appreciate that there was an effort put into limiting some of these robot spawns, you can still spawn infinite iBots. All you have to do is fail to pick a lock over and over and over, and there are other methods as well. This PR does not limit the spawn of the iBots themselves. Additionally, 10 robots being spawned is still, in my opinion, just so ridiculously high of a number. Where were all of these bots during, like, you know, the zombie apocalypse? We've got a game that forces scarcity on firearms and a myriad other items because quote-unquote realism, but we allow these robots to spawn other robots out of thin air. I think that these robots are relics of the game from six or eight years ago. I don't really think they have a place in the current versions of the game. They have ten robots to spare after a zombie apocalypse? You're telling me that they were not destroyed by looters or sent out to fight with the billions of zombies on the planet? So yeah, I don't feel that this change has really done much. Players can still infinitely farm robot parts if that is what their intention is, and it can still murder players with these magically spawned robots. I appreciate an effort to limit their numbers, but this is nowhere close to the limits that should be imposed. I'm sure it would require significant work, but I think the way to do this is to limit the spawn of iBots themselves. Not only that, but I think we should have a pool, so to speak, of possible police bot spawns tied to the local area. That way we get one or two robots being spawned in any given section of a town. In the current stage of the game, I could easily call up 50 robots to kill and harvest them if I wanted to. And I feel that honestly, there should only be one or two spawned ever, period, because most law enforcement robots would have been engaged with or been killed by the undead or destroyed by rioters. But anyway, yeah, that's my stance. I believe that there should be a limit on cop bots and iBots in general because most of them would have been killed in the riots prior to the game. Moving on, we've got a change to infinite water tiles from night. Previously, if you found a water tile in the forest or in a swamp, it was infinite. You could fill jugs from that tile for the rest of your game and it would never be depleted. This change made it so that most water tiles like these will now be finite. And I think they were also renamed to recesses, although I can't find that now that I'm looking for it. There was at least one subsequent PR that also addressed the tiles in certain special spawned locations that involve forests and whatnot just to keep things consistent. However, there are some of these sub-locations in the game that probably have not been updated yet. This means you may still be able to find these old infinite tiles of water when you're just exploring the world. And of course, any areas that you've already explored in your game, they will still have the old tiles. This doesn't magically convert terrain that you've already seen. And then also, of course, rivers and backyard pools, things like that are still going to be infinite tiles as far as I know. And this makes sense, even the smallest pool in someone's backyard is going to contain hundreds if not thousands of gallons of water. So how do I feel about this change? Well, honestly, I sort of love it. I think it makes sense from a realism perspective and it's also not very punishing to players. There are people who panicked over this, but the new recesses contain so much water that you really should not be concerned. The tiles are less common in a forest, for example, but each puddle still contains 80 to 150 portions of water, at least based on my limited testing. A 60 liter tank, for instance, is 240 portions of water. So instead of using one infinite tile to fill a tank, it will now be two to three finite tiles. And at the end of the day, that's just not a very big deal. Anyway, yeah, I like this change. I think that if you're panicked over this, you really shouldn't be. And yeah, you are going to be fine. Next up, we've got some changes to welding from Alex Foltz. Some folks pointed this out to me last week, but it was after the cutoff date for the last show, so we're going to talk about it today. This change has added consumables that are now required for welding. Specifically, these would be welding rods, welding wire, and brazing rods. These items have been added to spawn groups, mostly in garages, so you will find them out and about in the world. And many, or maybe all of them, I actually <laughs> I didn't check if they're all craftable, but many of them are at least craftable. And mostly you will make these things using a forge. The component requirements differ from recipe to recipe and are mostly things that you already have lying around. The exceptions here that I don't personally pick up are things like sand or lye, and a few other chemicals that I just don't usually pay attention to. To be honest, I'm not sure how common some of these are. Like, uh, I don't think I've ever picked up manganese dioxide, so I, I can't really assess on how hard it is to make these things. The skills required to craft these things seems to be a range of 3 to 5 in fabrication, and they also use applied science of 
of varying skill levels. I personally think that requiring Fab 5 to make what is essentially a forged rod of metal is a bit ridiculous, but I'm also guessing that maybe I just don't know enough about welding and maybe it would be really difficult. But for an example, making aluminum welding wire requires Fab 5, but it's not some complicated chemical bath or electrolysis or anything like that. You are literally just forging aluminum and then using a wire draw machine to make wire. That is 100% not something that is a Fab 5 task. That's something that I would expect to use like Fabrication 3 at the most. I just think someone should take a look at it. It seems like it's too high of a skill requirement. By comparison, for example, the normal welding wire requires you to handle acid which is obviously a more complex thing than simply jamming aluminum into a wire machine. But the acid one only requires Fab 4, where the aluminum wire requires Fab 5. So yeah, I think someone should take a look at balancing out these skill levels. I think 5 is too high for basically just feeding a metal into a wire machine. It smells to me like an arbitrary attempt to keep players from making them at low skill levels, even though realistically they could probably be made at low skill levels. And of course, I don't know that that's what the intention is, but it feels a little bit like that to me. And actually, I had several people ask for my opinion on this change specifically. Honestly, I think the addition of consumable welding rods is and things like like it, I think that's totally fine. It does add an extra layer of difficulty when it comes to getting around to vehicle work. I can definitely see those things becoming a major hindrance to anyone that, for instance, wants to make a vehicle completely from scratch. But then again, doing such a thing would be a major investment of time and resources, so of course it would be difficult. I think people want me to say that this is a bad change, but I really, I don't think it is. I think it's totally fine. Welding has been too easy, basically from day one when it was added into the game. But if you're asking if the spawns are balanced or if the recipes require too many rods or something like that, the answer is that I don't know. I'm going to have to play with this for a few games before I form opinions on what the actual balance of it is. It's not like some of the other changes we get where I simply can look at them and know through you know years of game experience whether it's a good change or a bad change. To me, this change is fine. Yes, it's an extra hurdle, but it's a hurdle that should be there, and I'm going to have to play with it before I can form a real opinion. So sorry if you were expecting me to trash this change or you know whatever. Go out, get in the habit of picking up the rods and the wire when you find them, and and these give you an additional reason to pick up certain chemicals or to, to make a forge, things like that. I do think the skill levels on the recipe should be looked at, but I'm ultimately on board for this change. Next up, we have major, major spoilers for the Exodii faction. I still don't know how to say that name, by the way. If you don't know what that is, or you don't want spoilers regarding them, then I'm giving you a chance now to step away or skip to another section of the video. In the meantime, hey, look at this meme. This is, uh, this is the best one I've seen that accurately sums up my feelings over the last couple of years. Anyway, the Exodii are a new faction that is coming slash have been coming to the game over the last year or so. The project has mainly been handled by Urk, who is kind of the mastermind behind this. Now, if you recall, maybe actually I don't know, like six months ago maybe? Uh, but a while back we had Bionics removed from all zombie harvests in the vanilla game. And this was in preparation of Bionics being moved almost exclusively to this new faction. In the end, we will do quests for them, we will trade them for resources, and we will be rewarded with Bionics and the ability to install those Bionics. And although I have made clear that I strongly disagreed with the decision to remove Bionics before adding the new sources into the game, I'm still on board for this faction. I think the Exodii are really interesting and they have a ton of potential to be a really cool addition to the game. And over the last few months we've had many additions to the game like resource drops and a few special NPCs or monsters for this faction. And each time that I saw one of these changes pop up I considered talking about it but ultimately they didn't have much impact on the average player's game. They weren't bad or anything but you couldn't trade with them or really use most of what you would find around them so there just wasn't a reason to talk about them in this show. However, we have had a recent addition from Urk that will finally have a notable impact on players. Namely, this allows for a trader in the Exodii base to sell players CBMs and help them install them. And they also sell like faction armor and stuff like that that I'm a little less interested in to be honest. Now if you have not seen an Exodii base before, they are currently capable of spawning in the game. Currently, there is an NPC in the Refugee Center that can point you at the Exodii base in case you cannot find it on your own. Now when you do find the place, you're going to head up to the second floor and you're going to talk to a cyborg called Rubik. 
When you talk to them, most of the dialogue options will be for various pieces of lore. After a bit of going through the options, I asked about Bionics and it opened my trade window. Then I traded him about $200 worth of goods, but I asked for nothing in return. I don't really know what the threshold or requirements are, but you do have to trade with him before you can progress. After doing this, I was then given further dialogue options where I could ask them to make me a cyborg. This will then give you a quest. Now the dialogue says to gather anesthesia kits, and although they use the plural form, I gave them one full one which was enough to complete the quest. And then here's kind of where I ran into some bugs and some issues. When I tried to complete the quest, it said that I did not have the requirements and it threw an error. However, the quest did successfully complete after several error messages. They also let me keep the anesthesia kit, which I gotta assume that's a bug. It was probably supposed to be removed from my inventory. Upon completing the mission, I was able to follow some more dialogue options and the ability to buy Bionics was then unlocked. The trader's inventory was updated and I could now buy some of the base level CBMs. However, when I exited the trade window and dialogue, I was then knocked unconscious and operated on. Presumably, this was him turning me into a cyborg like we had previously discussed. This did, of course caused me to lose control of my character for some period of time, however when it was completed I had been given a cable charger CBM and a power storage CBM. Both were installed on my character and this was pretty great. Now I assume this was also a bug, the operation being delayed until after I had closed the dialogue window, it probably isn't supposed to be that way. But anyway, after this I could then purchase more CBMs or I could go and loot them in the world like you normally would. There's a new dialogue option here that says can you help me with CBM surgery? When you select that option, it will open a window showing the various CBMs that you have available to you and the prices required for the surgery to get them installed. Once I traded enough money to pay for it, I end the trade and the surgery begins. Now the only issue I see with this is that I appear to only be able to install one CBM at a time, which is pretty tedious to flip through all of these menus and trade windows every time I want to install something. However, that is the basic process by which you will install new CBMs, and of course this is going to get refined over time. Most of the things I complained about are going to get ironed out. Hopefully that all made sense. This wasn't really intended to be a comprehensive explanation of how to do this, but it did sort of turn into a longer segment than I intended. So let's back up now and talk about the PR itself. I think the addition of the surgery and the ability to buy CBMs is just so fantastic. I love that. I think that the dialogue tree and the process by which you get them installed is buggy and buried in menus, which is pretty bad, but ultimately that'll be refined in the future and is not a big deal. And I think that having a failure chance on these CBM installations is a really bad choice. In my testing, I paid $20 for a crappy CBM, I paid another $20 for the surgery, I had a 1% fail chance, and then I rolled on that 1%. I was suddenly out of the money I spent, the guy was out of a CBM stock in his inventory, and I had rolled a natural one. Now hopefully that was just RNG and not indicative of another bug. But I gotta be honest, if I did all of that in my actual gameplay and it rolled out that way, I would be pretty furious. You're telling me that this advanced civilization that can manufacture bionics and mech walkers and all kinds of crazy stuff like that, they can't guarantee an installation in my body? I, I just don't understand that. This seems like an arbitrary barrier and I really don't like that. I think with all the rigmarole surrounding getting these bionics, you could at least guarantee that I get the thing installed. And I think this is even worse once you get to higher tier CBMs that will be locked behind quests and the quantity available will be locked behind the trader's inventory refreshing every couple of days. So basically what I'm saying is like just imagine that you just did a big quest for this faction. After presumably probably days or weeks of work, you have finally unlocked the good CBMs. The trader will probably only be able to sell one of these items at any given time and it's probably going to be expensive. You buy this nice new CBM, you know, money isn't a huge barrier in this game or anything, but it still costs you money. You also then pay for this surgery and then you find out that the surgery fails. Not only have you wasted all that money and whatever you sold to get that money, but you also might not be able to buy another of those CBMs until the trader's stock gets refreshed in a few days. And I don't know if the CBMs are guaranteed, so 
so maybe next week he won't even sell that particular bionic. You might have to wait over and over until it pops up again. Now I know that this maybe doesn't sound like a big deal, but those are a lot of feels bad moments and I personally feel like the super faction that can make CBMs and stuff should probably be able to install them without any risk of failure. Now this strikes me either as a bug because I thought they had said that this would be a guarantee success or it's an arbitrary decision that I don't think makes any sense. And it looks like higher tier CBMs have a higher failure rate so who knows how many times you're going to have to do this. You might fail and repeat this cycle over and over before you get the thing that you've worked really hard to obtain. But anyway, anyway, hopefully that all makes sense. I really do like the starter quest giving you a power storage CBM and a cable charger. I remember the days when all of this was complete RNG. You would hope that you would find a battery and then you would also hope that you found a way to charge it. I think it's really nice to have those barriers removed from the game and it obviously makes sense because those are the first things you're going to install when you make someone a cyborg. And again, in a more abstract sense, I really do like the idea of the Exodii, and I'm excited for them to continue being added to the game. My only real issue with this ever has been the fact that they removed Bionics from Zombie Harvest before they added new methods to obtain them. And now, finally, we have that new method to obtain them. So yeah, I really, really, really like this change. I'm excited to see more complex missions added to the faction over time, and I will be watching to see if the dialogue tree gets improved or nested in a way that's a little less complex and a little bit easier to read at a glance. I'm happy to have another trader in the game that actually offers something of value rather than the random garbage that most of the other merchants have. And this is a really good change despite a few of the hiccups and what I'm assuming are bugs. Anyway, yeah, this segment uh, turned out to be way longer than I intended and I still didn't even cover everything so let's just move on to our final change of the week and then finally today we've got some spoilers for ferals if you don't want spoilers you should peace out blah 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 and while we wait hey look some cute puppies are on the screen the stock footage site says that they're corgis and corgis are adorable so you know yeah Anyway, yeah, we've got some additions to ferals from Biohazard Suit, and I'm gonna jump straight to the point. This PR adds three new feral enemies, two of which have firearms. Not only firearms, but one of them actually uses automatic weapons, so yeah. The feral prepper uses a 9mm handgun and starts with three rounds of ammo. I think that this is reasonable, and I think choosing 9mm was a really good way to go. Most characters can tank a 9mm round, even if they're shot in the head, and mostly we have armor on our head and torso anyway. And of course, of course, 9mm is a very common round, uh, Glocks are extremely popular in the United States. So yeah, they have a gun, but most likely you are not going to be murdered by fighting just one of them. Their range is 0 to 14 tiles, and the cooldown is 10, so depending on your speed, I would expect a bullet every like 8 or so turns. Now the accuracy is not good, but it's not nothing either. Keeping them at a range of 3 tiles, I seem to take about 2 out of every 3 bullets most of the time in my testing. These enemies also have pretty low tier armor values, although they do have have 4 Ballistic, which is more than most of the standard zombies in the game. Their melee damage is not very impressive, but they do have a dodge skill of 4, which is extremely significant and will probably annoy you. For a point of reference, the base ferals in the game have a dodge of 1, and a child zombie has a dodge of 2. I don't really know how to say what I mean, but I think 4 is too high of a value. As for their loot, we will talk about that at the end. Now the other firearm ferrule is the Mad Militia. This enemy has an automatic weapon. It's a lot like the one that we just discussed, except that their armor is notably better, especially their ballistic armor. It also has a 7 in melee, which I think is just like, his. I was going to say it's high, but I actually think it's hilariously high compared to pretty much every enemy in the game. For point of reference, the only other thing I know in the game that has a melee of 7 is a Migo. And of course, Migo are terrifying killing machines, whereas the Mad Militia here is literally just some dude. Uh, but the real problem here with this creature is that it has a range of 30 tiles for its firearm. This means that literally the enemy can hit you even when it's off screen. And, and honestly, this is not a super big deal. Some turrets can do that, but I do think this is really alarming. Now, the more alarming thing here is that it really, regardless of range, would hit me with 100% of its shots. Now, I actually wrote out a really long thing to explain in, in good terms why this is broken, but it's apparently a bug. I did make an issue for it if you want to read about it, uh, about why it's terrible, but it turned out it was a duplicate, so I will link to both issues in the description down below. 
So at the moment, this doesn't seem to be working as intended. As far as I can tell, it hits with 100% accuracy regardless of what its range is, and it starts with 10 rounds that do 556 five, ammo levels of damage. This means that it's pretty well a guaranteed death if you are in the open, and honestly, most of the time, even if you're close quarters with it. It will very likely kill you 100% of the time, so I recommend debug killing them for the time being if you don't want to be murdered immediately. Even in a Kevlar vest and swap SWAT armor at the same time, it still would kill me sometimes with two shots to the torso or even one shot to the head. This is wildly, wildly dangerous and it's broken at the moment and I recommend just, I don't know, like I will probably debug kill all of them until this gets fixed. I think this is the sort of enemy that if you do it wrong or if the there are issues in how it is implemented, it quickly becomes an unbalanced nightmare. However, based on the feedback that I've seen, this is probably an issue with aiming being broken and not an issue with the ferrule itself. I do, however, think that they should remove these from the game until these issues get sorted out. And there was also a third feral added in this PR, but it's really not nearly as noteworthy. You can check it out if you're interested. But now I want to talk about the loot that these enemies drop. In the PR, it says that their loot was based off of survivor zombies. However, they did make their own loot tables in order to do this. So if you've never looked at loot in the game, it's actually a complicated mix of different groups of items and can be very hard to read. Or maybe it's just because I'm stupid, but because of that, I didn't thoroughly go through their loot. The important thing that I want to mention is that they will drop their firearms if if they are a firearm feral, it seems to be a guaranteed drop. I'm really glad to see that. It frustrates me when I find enemies that have abilities or descriptions that hint at them having something, but then they don't drop that item. An example of that would be hazmat zombies that don't always drop a hazmat suit. As for survivor zombies specifically, they have really bad loot in general. They're an example of something that should have really good loot, but they generally drop garbage. The survivor zombies are intended to be people like this, the player who have survived for a period of time. That means that they should be dropping stuff that would be really valuable for the player. And unfortunately, when you kill them, they almost never have real, actually valuable loot, which in my opinion, they really should. So I was hoping that these ferals would be a little bit better. Someone on Discord said that they can drop survivor armor, but after testing this pretty thoroughly, I never saw any of that stuff. All I saw that they dropped were some basic tools, the, the weapons, obviously, that they would drop, and then random clothing that's really not very valuable. If these enemies are supposedly people who were militia or survived for a period of time before and after the apocalypse, they should probably have real armor. They do seem to drop Kevlar vests that are very damaged, but that's all that they seem to have. Additionally, just because they don't know how to reload their guns, that doesn't mean they should drop no ammo. That really bothers me. They can drop pistols and whatnot, but I don't, I, but I think they should have loose ammo in their drop tables. One of the growing pet peeves of mine with the game is that we always say that there was a lot of panic buying of ammunition, but then when it comes time to find it on bodies or stockpiled in locations, it's all magically been used. And if you think about it, sure, you would shoot what you could as you were being mauled by zombies, but let's be real, the billions of rounds of ammo in the US did not magically disappear. With the rate at which people were being killed, we should be finding stockpiles of it in houses or garages and loose in people's pockets and backpacks. Same with guns, really. Everybody wants to make looted gun shops, but guns don't magically evaporate. If they were all looted, then we should be finding them in stockpiles in the world or guns on most enemies that we defeat. But anyway, that's a discussion for another time. That was a bit meandering. Hopefully that all made sense. Let's call the episode here. Everybody, this was a long one. Thank you for sticking it out to the end. Sorry again for being sick. I don't know how I sounded. I won't know until I get into editing. But thank you for watching in general. And I, of course, will be back in a couple of weeks with another episode.